The views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Natural Bridges Media or KSQD's staff, volunteers, or underwriters. Hello and welcome to Talk of the Bay. I'm your host, Len B.A. And today, my guest is Maurice Carney. Maurice Carney is a co-founder and the executive director of Friends of the Congo. Maurice Carney, welcome to Talk of the Bay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you, Len. Yeah, thank you for being here, and uh, you are joining us from, I uh, understand, the Washington, D.C. area, so I appreciate your staying late for uh, the opportunity to uh, share a little bit with our listeners. Oh, no, it's, it's totally, totally uh, my pleasure. Uh, I look forward to the exchange with you and uh, engaging with your listeners. Uh, every one of us who uses a smartphone, a tablet, or a laptop is very likely carrying around a piece of the Congo with us in the form of the cobalt shielding in our devices. How big a role does the presence of the cobalt mines and the world's demand for the mineral play in the current situation in the Democratic Republic of the Congo? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the the cobalt... Uh coming out of the Congo uh, is one of the uh, myriad of minerals uh, that, uh, and re natural resources that have uh, come out of the Congo. And, and I think it requires a, a little bit of uh, history and framing uh, so that uh, cobalt is not isolated and people, your audience uh, fully understands uh, the, the scope uh, of what uh, not only is currently un unfolding in the Congo, but what has unfolded historically. Uh, the, uh, the Congo is a country that is the uh, size of Western Europe, and it's located in the heart of the African continent, uh, straddles the equator, has a population of uh, about 100 million uh, inhabitants or so, one of the largest countries in the world, and arguably one of the richest in terms of uh, natural resources. And in its modern form, uh, it's a country that was designed um, by Europeans uh, coming out of the 1884 to 85 Berlin Conference uh, for the purposes of extracting natural resources uh, out of the country. That was, that, if you look at the, the rail, the roads, everything was designed to for maximum extraction of resources. And in the late 1800s, it was uh, rubber was the primary, it was rubber and ivory, but rubber is the primary uh, resource that Europeans, European powers extracted in order to feed the burgeoning auto industry. And within a 23 year period from 1885 to 1908, uh, an estimated 10 million Congolese perished uh, as a result of the brutal extraction of those resources. So the population was decimated by half. So wow. uh, throughout the history of the Congo, where you find the extraction, uh, you also extraction of natural resources to, to power and fuel uh, Western and global industries, you find that the Congolese suffer uh, tremendously uh, in numbers that are mind-boggling. So by the same token, uh, from 1996 to the present, an estimated 6 million Congolese have perished in a conflict uh, that in large part is fueled uh, by the pursuit of uh, natural resources, coltan and cobalt and copper and tin, wolframite, you name it, that gold that fuel the modern technology uh, industry. Um, so the, that design of the Congo by Europeans in the late 1800s uh, has not fundamentally changed to this day. Right? So we have over 125 years 
of extraction of natural resources, whether it was rubber in the late 1800s for the auto industry, uh, whether it was the uh, uranium around World War II that went into the atomic weapon that was developed by the Manhattan Project that uh, ultimately uh, resulted in bombs being dropped on, on Japan, or at the uh, start of the 20th, uh, the uh, new millennium, the coltan that is used uh, for the capacitors in our cell phones that uh, uh, may, that power our cell phones. And um, nearly two decades into the, the new century, whether it's cobalt uh, that now is used uh, for uh, the batteries in our iPads and our iPhones and our laptops and our electric vehicles. So it's critical for uh, your audience to understand that uh, the system that was put in place whereby resources were extracted at the expense of the Congolese people remain intact to this day. And each, it appears in any case, that each technological advance that we see in the Western world, uh, we find at the bottom, on the belly of it, are resources coming out of the Congo that are vital to the functioning of these technological uh, gadgets or instruments that have been been developed. So cobalt is one in a long line of uh, natural resources that have been plundered in, uh, in the Congo uh, for the benefit of consumers uh, in the West and globally, and certainly multinational corporations. So in the case of cobalt, uh, which is vital to the functioning of uh, rechargeable batteries, Congo is the largest producer in the world. Uh, in 2020 figures, 70% of the cobalt produced in the world comes out of the Congo. So if you add up all the countries in the world that produces cobalt, they do not equal the amount of cobalt Congo uh, produces. And Congo, in, in combination, in concert with its neighbor, uh, Zambia, uh, has more than half of the world's uh, reserves of cobalt. Uh, so wow. it's a key strategic mineral in a country that uh, is uh, filled with natural resources that are vital to the functioning of a wide range of modern industries, whether we're talking about the electronics industry, the automobile industry, technology industry, the jewelry industry, the aerospace industry, the military industry, which is what cobalt uh, is was primarily uh, used for by the U.S. military. It's a strategic, protected mil uh, uh, mineral uh, by the by the U.S. military. It's a it's a key mineral for for the uh, U.S. military industry. Wow. And here we are. Um, you know this incredible wealth of resources in the Congo, and yet it's uh, a. a huge portion of the population lives at very, very low poverty levels. Um, and this, this exploitation has been going on for a long time. It, the Congo used to be a colony of Belgium. And last month marked 62 years since the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, who was the first elected prime minister after the country gained independence from Belgium. And we know from the uh, church hearings in the United States in the 1970s that uh, the U.S. covert operations had a hand in the coup that overthrew his, uh, his government. Um, can you tell us about some more about that history and what its consequences have been for people in the Congo? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, in reference to the church um, commission, uh, and in the 1970s, uh, but even uh, within the last uh, decade or so, uh, the U.S. State Department uh, published declassified documents that deal with that era and U.S. foreign policy from uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and in the you, the State Department's uh, documents it's, that it's it published, uh, a few things that uh, that stand out. Uh, one, uh, the covert action in the Congo 
on the part of the United States was the largest co largest covert action in terms of financing in the world uh, to that date wow. to that uh, date in uh, and it uh, was uh, the Congo was really the the first major intervention on the part of the United States on the African continent uh, to uh, overthrow a, a democratically elected prime minister uh, not fundamentally different from what they did in the 70s with uh, Allende in Chile, for example, or the role they played with the British, uh, with Mossadegh in the, in the 50s in, in Iran. Uh, so, and you have the, the chief of station uh, of the CIA at the time, uh, Larry Devlin. Uh, he wrote a book uh, entitled Chief of Station Congo. And in there, uh, he basically laid out uh, a playbook uh, for how uh, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, goes about overthrowing a democratically elected uh, leader, uh, which in and it's corroborated. Some of the uh, data he provides and information he provides is corroborated by the declassified documents. Uh, for example, he talks about the extent to which he goes to corrupt Congolese elites. Uh, the declassified documents from the State Department talks about uh, the, as an instrument of destabilizing uh, a democratic state, uh, how uh, the U.S. Uh, floods uh, the political environment, let's say, the political playground with the money in order to buy off and to corrupt leaders so that they can uh, uh, you know, go against the interests of their, of their, of their population. Um, so and Patrice Lumumba uh, himself, he was an independence, uh, Congolese independence hero. Uh, he was born in 1925, uh, a young man at the time in 1960, and uh, 33, 34 years old when he um, assumed power on, on, uh, on June 30th, uh, 1960. I didn't realize and he was that young. He, he was a, a, a nationalist and a Pan-Africanist. Uh, one who came out of the uh, Congolese elite, uh, they call the Evolué, which is a, an African, a Congolese that the Belgian created, the Belgians created in order to mimic uh, European uh, habits, traits, and aspire to be European. And he, he committed really class suicide in, a, in one sense, and also... Uh, uh, cultural suicide in terms of uh, cutting the umbilical cord between what Belgians would like the Congolese to be and uh, or what, as opposed to them drawing from their, their cultural uh, uh, heritage. So he, he, as a nationalist and a Pan-Africanist, assumed power and he articulated a vision whereby the Congolese would be the primary beneficiaries of the resources of the Congo, and that his government would make sure that that's, that would happen. And this um, sent uh, shockwaves through the capitals of, of the West, and they didn't give him much time. Within, about, uh, within a week or so, uh, the, the Belgians, the US, uh, through its Central Intelligence Agency, the United Nations, other Western powers, uh, started to destabilize uh, Lumumba's government. Uh, within a matter of weeks, uh, the, there was a, a coup, and in less than uh, seven months, he was assassinated on January 17, 1961, uh, because he hmm. uh, saw Congo as being central, uh, not only to providing uh, a certain standard of living for the population, but also central to uh, the industrialization and the unification of the African continent. And in his book, Chief of Station, uh, Congo, the CIA uh, head, Larry Devlin, said that uh, we had to get rid of the Congo, I mean, uh, of Lumumba, because if we didn't get Lum rid of Lumumba, not only would we have lost the Congo, we would have lost all of Africa. Uh, so we see the centrality of Congo uh, in terms of uh, the the grand let's say the grand chessboard for the continent of Africa as a whole that is a key country and the United States couldn't have it 
uh, leave it in the hands of a nationalist and a pan-Africanist that wanted the, the wealth and those resources. As you can see today, how valuable those resources are uh, to be in the hands of, uh, of uh, control by, by Africans and Congolese. Right. And if I remember right, the uh, leadership that was brought in in the wake of the, that coup and the assassination of Lumumba was very corrupt and was in power for quite, quite a min, many, many years. Yes, yes. He was primarily led by uh, Joseph Desiree Mobutu, who was on the, see, the, the payroll of the, the Central Intelligence Agency uh, uh, even before Lumumba was, uh, was elected. Uh, he initiated the, the, the first coup, and uh, the last coup that he uh, undertook was in 1965. And from 1965 to 1997, uh, he ruled the Congo as a, uh, as a dictator. And he ruled the Congo uh, with the full support uh, of the United States. Uh, one can argue that the, not only the United States uh, installed uh, Mobutu, but they also maintained Mobutu in power for over three decades because every time the Congolese would rise up to get rid of Mobutu, the U.S. Um, either directly or through its proxies would um, go in and crush uh, the, the resistance uh, to Mobutu and uh, assure his um, security and maintenance uh, in power because he played a key role uh, in terms of uh, facilitating uh, U.S. interests, uh, not only in uh, in Central Africa, uh, but uh, particularly in Angola, but throughout the, the continent as a whole. Um, so there, 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 there would be no Mobutu uh, without uh, the United States, and he certainly wouldn't have um, stayed in power for over three decades uh, without the full backing and support of the United States. So the, the extent to which that we, we, we've seen uh, the destruction of uh, Congolese uh, society and people uh, from the independence, uh, really right up to this day, uh, the United States uh, has been deeply in implicated and uh, profoundly uh, responsible uh, for the uh, devastating uh, conditions in which we find uh, Congolese people to this day. Yeah, and it's an echo of, of the results of U.S. intervention, uh, especially clandestine intervention in, in other countries, uh, in 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 Iran, in in Guatemala, Honduras, uh, absolutely, and um, absolutely. and more recently Afghanistan and Iraq. We we are not exactly getting what I'd call positive results from these. <laughs> no, these not not, not at all, and and uh, and. Uh, Actually, what's happening is that we're getting the results that's desired, right? Uh, a, uh, By somebody. A weakened yes. Congo uh, that uh, has weak leadership and leadership uh, that is uh, tethered um, to, to the West, uh, the U.S. or uh, Belgium or France or, or, the, or the U.K. Uh, is in the interests of uh, certainly Western corporate interests. Um, because you, you have a situation where if you look in the Congo today, uh, where 70 million people, seven out of every 10 Congolese live on less than $2 a day. Uh, and there's a capitalist system in place where one individual, a gentleman, an Israeli by the name of Dan Gerler, uh, he makes $200,000 a day in royalties uh, from one of the major mining companies, uh, Glencore, uh, that's uh, in the Congo company that establishes relationships uh, for extraction of copper and cobalt uh, with the major auto companies in the, in the U.S., uh, with uh, companies like Tesla, for example, uh, the, three, the, big, the big three out of, uh, out of Detroit. Uh, so uh, the Congolese people are living in a, are victims of a capitalist system that has, uh, has them making, seven out of ten of them making less than $2 a day, and you have this one individual who has uh, worked his way uh, to cavort uh, with the Congolese leadership, the, uh, I guess you can call him the comprador class, and uh, get access to uh, mining concessions where he can uh, make royalties of uh, $200,000 uh, a day. And if you put that $200,000 a day with this one individual, 
have they gained 70 million Congolese of making $2 a day, and that gives you a sense of the type of uh, uh, exploitative conditions uh, under which the Congolese, uh, the masses of the Congolese live. Wow. If you're just joining us here on Talk of the Bay on KSQD, my guest is Maurice Carney. He is currently the executive director of uh, 501c3 organization Friends of the Congo. Maurice, your your um, your mention of that comment from Larry Devlin that if we lost Af- if we lost the Congo, we'd lose all of Africa, um, is kind of rec- reminiscent of a uh, an echo comment that Malcolm X said in a speech in 1964. He said, "As long as we think that we should get Mississippi straightened out before we worry about the Congo, you'll never get Mississippi straightened out." not until you start realizing your connection with the Congo. And I wondered if you could talk about essentially really the racism that has governed the problems in both places uh, mm. for, for this uh, more th- well more than a century now, um, going on a century and a half um, since, since Belgium colonized uh, that region. Um, yes, yes. And, and uh, there's so many layers to the racism, the white supremacy, as you know, it's a global system. And uh, Malcolm was uh, right on. Uh, that was in a, that, came, that quote came out of uh, an exchange that uh, uh, Malcolm had in 1964 at one of the uh, early meetings of the Organization of Afro-American Unity, uh, where he was to screen a film on the Congo and uh, talk about the Congo. And uh, people in the audience are in Harlem, and they're like, you know, what are you talking about the Congo? We we catch it hell right here in Harlem, right? Right. Uh, why, why are we dealing with the Congo? And then Malcolm gave that uh, brilliant uh, response. Uh, uh, so he he made the connection in the in the sense that uh, racism is global in scope. And if you look at that quote from Malcolm, and look and you read uh, Patrice Lumumba's June thirtieth um, speech. Uh, at the inauguration, which he wasn't supposed to to give, he wasn't scheduled to speak. He just took the mic, and even though he was the elected prime minister, uh, it was the king of Belgium and the the moderate president uh, of the Congo that uh, was scheduled to to speak. And uh, Lumumba, uh, you know, Bogart the, the mic, and and in his speech, he talked about the the racism. Uh, the, the the attempt of the Belgians to impose an apartheid system in the Congo itself, where uh, you had whites only um, stores and establishments, uh, where uh, you the the, the so called uh, native or the Congolese had to refer to the, the white the European the Belgian as master, uh, where uh, in order for you to move up in the social ladder, the uh, colonial administrators had to come to your house and uh, uh, pose a, a series of questions uh, to you to see if you're fit to be a part of the so-called evolué. Um, so we had the deep-seated uh, racism in, the, in Belgium, and of course, people are familiar with, uh, with Mississippi and uh, you know the Jim Crow practices of, uh, of Mississippi uh, that really extend in, in a lot of respects, uh, certainly in the in the, in the legal system uh, to, to this um, to this very day. Um, so Malcolm made that connection. And Malcolm was a, a great admirer of uh, Patrice Lumumba. He named one of his daughters after Lumumba. And just about any speech you listen to from Malcolm, he would uh, talk about Lumumba. He even said, to, went as far as to say Lumumba was the greatest African to ever walk the, uh, the, the continent. Um, so we, we see this uh, uh, Malcolm bringing to the fore uh, the question of uh, of racism, and even to this day, that that racism is expressed in a, in a very peculiar way, uh, and this is why I say that that we have in the Congo from 1996 to the present an estimated an estimated six million human beings that have perished, right? Uh, but yet, uh, the Congo story. Uh, according to Doctors Without Borders, consistently every year remains one of the top 10 underreported stories. Uh, those lives are so devalued that 
uh, millions of them can evaporate from the planet without the planet even knowing about it, without people even knowing about it, uh, without uh, people even being present to the fact that we've lost uh, six million, and this is conservative uh, estimate of our fellow human beings. Uh, so uh, one of the key explanations of that is that these lives, these Congolese lives, these African lives, these black lives uh, are not worthy of even acknowledging that they've disappeared, that they've perished. Uh, so uh, that yeah. uh, racism as it relates to uh, the Congo, which is uh, littered you know, throughout uh, the last century or so uh, in history. So it was referred to as, in Joseph Conrad's work and in his uh, classical work uh, as the heart of darkness. And people still see it uh, to this day as uh, a dark space in the very heart of, con uh, of the continent uh, with uh, subhuman uh, existence and uh, a place that's in perpetual conflict and violence and uh, debauchery is uh, atavistic and innate among the people. Therefore, it doesn't require the kind of focus, attention, consideration uh, that, say, people perishing in Ukraine uh, deserve, right? Yeah. Uh, if people are perishing in Ukraine as a result of a, a conflict, uh, then, you know, that, re that requires a global mobilization and uh, international media focusing and, and going into every nuance and detail about the lives of those uh, uh, Ukrainians that are being destroyed. Uh, but you don't get the same kind of uh, attention, focus, or human respect and decency when it comes to what we've seen in the, in the Congo, what the United Nations says is the deadliest conflict in the world since World War II. But you would never know it uh, right. by, uh, you know, uh, canvassing the, uh, the global media landscape. No, you definitely would not. I mean, it seems like the only times they do report is in times of disaster, and then it's a it's a snapshot, and you rarely find out what happened afterwards. and And the same is true in places like Yemen that we yeah, absolutely we can yeah, disregard. Somehow, those people just don't count as much; they don't get the attention. It's uh, and, and and especially considering the extent to which the United States is uh, is implicated in terms of its. It's uh, back in providing military and intelligence and equipment uh, to Saudi Arabia uh, in, in right. their quest to, to destroy Yemen and, and then providing diplomatic and political cover uh, for uh, the atrocities that have been, been committed there and continue to be committed. So yeah. absolutely, when, when U.S. interests are involved, engaged, uh, the media usually swings, the corporate media, <laughs> to the side of the U.S. interests, right? What, uh, uh, or what, or what we're States told should military... be our interests, at least. Exactly, yeah. exactly what you're told to be, exactly. Yeah. And um, I, I understand there are still some sort of uh, conflicts because some of the areas of mining are sort of controlled by, um, for lack of a better word, warlords. Um, mm. Is that still true in Congo or has that that changed? Well, for, for the past 25 years or so, coming out of uh, the genocide in Rwanda, uh, Congo has been a victim of a war of aggression and plunder uh, by its neighbors. Uh, speaking of primarily uh, Rwanda under the leadership of Paul Kagame, who's been in power that long, and uh, Yeri Museveni of Uganda, who's been in power over three decades. These are two key allies of the United States. And they've invaded Congo twice, 1996 and 1998. It was a 1998 invasion that triggered a loss of uh, an estimated 5.4 million, according to the International Rescue Committee and its mortality studies. Uh, and these two countries have even fought each other on Congolese soil. In 2000, they call it the Six Day War that killed a thousand and injured scores. Uh, and they're able to wage this war of aggression and plunder to the extent that they do with impunity, uh, without any accountability, without any justice, because they've received the backing of the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, they wouldn't be able to do what they're doing in the Congo without, if it weren't for the United States in particular and the United Kingdom. 
uh, in the sense that the, the crimes that have been committed, uh, United Nations uh, published a report in 2010 called the UN Mapping Exercise Report. It said that if the crimes that have been committed in the Congo by the Rwandan military were to be put in front of a competent court, they could be brought up on charges of genocide. And this is a report that the United, the United States uh, tried to bury, uh, according to French diplomats, uh, that there's been very little action on. And uh, the United States continue to promote Paul Kagame, the president of uh, Rwanda, as a, an enlightened leader, a renaissance leader. And he gets uh, full access uh, to U.S. institutions. He comes to the U.S., go to university campuses, and wax eloquently uh, about his, his leadership uh, when uh, he is responsible uh, for, he's got the blood of millions of uh, Congolese on his hands. So these two countries, they have invaded Congo and they've also sponsored militia groups in the Congo. Uh, the latest is the M23, uh, where uh, the M23 rebels have displaced hundreds of thousands of Congolese in the east of the Congo and have occupied parts of the Congo and the United States government, uh, European Union, uh, United Nations have all said that uh, Rwanda is uh, responsible for arming and uh, supporting the M23. Uh, now they've all said it, uh, but they've uh, uh, refused to, to act in sanctioning mm -hmm. Rwanda, that is to say, uh, withholding military aid from Rwanda, which was done before about 10 years ago, uh, President Barack Obama did that. He withheld about $200,000 because the same M23 backed by Rwanda had destabilized the uh, east of the Congo and captured a, a city uh, of Goma, of 2 million people. Uh, and it was just too much. Uh, so the United States had to do something and they did the very little that they could, but other European nations joined in and withheld tens of millions of dollars. And that uh, resulted in Rwanda backing off and the M23 ret retreating, mm -hmm. uh, but they're back again. Um, so uh, we see here that uh, the aggressor nations, Rwanda and Uganda, led by two dictators, uh, got between the two of them over 50 years in power, uh, Paul Kagame and Yuri Museveni, uh, they're on the side of the US. Uh, so it makes it very difficult for international institutions uh, to uh, bring them to book uh, for the war crimes, crimes against humanity that they've committed and, and the plunder that they've committed in the Congo. Wow. Well, we're going to take a really short break and we'll be right back uh, with more conversation with Maurice Carney and uh, information about the Congo, a region that affects us in more ways than most of us are aware. And you're listening to Talk of the Bay on K-Squid, and I'm Len B.A. here with Maurice Carney, uh, the uh, co-founder and executive director of Friends of the Congo. Maurice, we were just talking about conflicts in the Congo and how, uh, you know, some of the um, bordering nations have uh, actually committed aggressive military action um, but we're also, a lot of people are dying just in the task of trying to make a living. And um, mm -hmm. there's been a little bit of media attention in the U.S. Uh, recently about uh, the uh, cobalt mines and um, also about some ecological concerns in the Congo, which I'd like to get to uh, later. But um, could you talk a little bit about the state of mining, and you mentioned that you know it, it's not just cobalt. There's there's gold, there's tin, there's uh, lots of other valuable minerals um, in in Congo, which are being essentially uh, you know extracted and exported um, for the world market. And I wonder if you could talk about the real conditions of mining and how that's taking a toll on the people. Sure, sure. Uh, the the mining for 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 this uh, response, we we'll focus primarily on the mining in the south of the of the country. There's really mining throughout the country, uh, but uh, there, there are two major types of mining uh, that's unfolding in the Congo. That's of particular importance to your um, your audience. Uh, one is called industrial mining. 
That is to say, big machines, uh, major um, corporations uh, from uh, the United States, uh, from India, from China, from Europe, uh, that are involved in industrial mining. That is uh, uh, accounts for about 80 uh, percent of the the mining, say, in the, in the cobalt area, for example, and in mining cobalt, you're talking about not just cobalt, it's not isolated, it's cobalt, nickel, and copper. Hmm. And then there's about 20% or so, 20 to 30% uh, that what they call artisanal mining. And artisanal mining is where you have an uh, average person that goes digging uh, for, for minerals. They use their, their hands, uh, sticks, uh, rudimentary tools, if they happen to dig into the ground, uh, they, there's no um, safety protection, uh, none, of, none of that. Uh, so that's the most um, extreme form of, uh, of mining where you see thousands, you, you can see thousands of uh, uh, Congolese in a pit just digging for, um, for, for, for cobalt. Uh, so those are the two types of uh, mining. And uh, truth be told, uh, Congolese are on the losing end in both uh, situations. Uh, as it relates to the industrial mining, uh, you have a situation where people are displaced from their land in order to provide access to multinational corporations. They're promised housing, they're promised schooling, they're promised health care. Uh, there are a lot of promises, uh, but very little is delivered upon uh, for those people who've been displaced uh, from their lands that uh, their traditional lands, which are now mines. Uh, the workers that work in uh, the industrial uh, mining sector, uh, they too uh, suffer. Uh, the rights and accountability in international development, uh, RAID, uh, recently um, published a, a report on the conditions of, uh, of workers, uh, that they don't um, get health care uh, they're not uh, guaranteed uh, their jobs if they get injured. They may be fired. Uh, they don't make uh, the minimum wage of three or $400 or so uh, a month. Uh, so uh, the conditions for the industrial workers, for the working class uh, in the industrial mines are uh, atrocious, especially if you consider uh, the uh, significance and the value of uh, cobalt, for example, to the to the world economy. Uh, so, uh, for the those working in uh, in the in the mines and as uh, in the industrialized sector, uh, they they live uh, continue to live in abject poverty. Uh, for the artisanal miners, uh, they're exposed uh, to a wide range of um, health uh, uh, conditions because uh, we're talking about. Uh, uh, minerals that are uh, that that uh, atomic, uh, you know, they 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 uh, actually result in uh, uh, asthma for 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 children. Uh, mothers who are in the mines, they uh, give birth to deformed um, children. Uh, even the Center for Disease um, Control has reported on the um, the health uh, conditions of the artisanal miners that. Uh, being uh, exposed uh, to uh, the uh, the cobalt and the uranium and the nickel and the copper uh, is devastating uh, for uh, the uh, unprotected uh, artisanal miners. And then uh, whether it's industrial or artisanal mining, uh, we see uh, what comes along with it is a destruction of the environment uh, where the areas where the mines are dug, whether by uh, hand or by a machine, uh, destroys the local environment, uh, pollutes the local water uh, system. Um, so uh, all around at the bottom, at the bottom of that uh, uh, chain, uh, that uh, economic uh, cycle, uh, we see uh, utter devastation uh, in terms of the environment, uh, in terms of the working class, uh, in terms of the health conditions for for children who are in mines, or for mothers who are in mines. Uh, we see uh, not only um, frequent injuries, uh, but um, deaths. Uh, there's an attorney by the name of Tolling, Terry Collingsworth who's brought a lawsuit against the major tech and automobile companies 
uh, on behalf of Congolese children who and families who have perished uh, as a result of their being in the mines and uh, extracting cobalt that go up the supply chain and wind up in your Teslas or your, the batteries of your your iPad or your your iPhone. Um, so uh, it's it's a pretty dire uh, situation uh, for for the working class and for the oppressed masses that are trying to eke out some form of living uh, in the mining areas of uh, uh, of the Congo. Yeah, and even in the United States, where we have uh, some uh, some fairly strong safety standards for mining, which were won by hard-fought battle by miners' unions, um, even here, people still die in mines. It's dangerous work. And so without Absolutely. those kind of safety standards or even any investment in making it safe, um, and and then compounded by the extreme poverty and people you know, finding no other means to make a living other than to do this so-called artisanal mining. Um, it's, it's a pretty grim picture. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's really a scar on the conscience of humanity uh, to know that uh, this is at the bottom of that chain when we we're using our cell phones, we're driving our automobiles, uh, that uh, Congolese children are, uh, trapped uh, into forced labor or slavery, as uh, Amnesty International would put it uh, in a study that they had done uh, a few years back, and that you have mothers uh, who are uh, and women uh, who are just suffering in uh, unbearable conditions as a result of uh, just trying to make a make a living. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're 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 just uh, connected, and, and that's part of the reason why. You know, Friends of the Congo does the work that it does to try and bring this to the world's attention, uh, that uh, there's a price to pay uh, for the instruments that we use, uh, the gadgets that we use. And at the very least, at the very least, uh, we have to be aware uh, of what's unfolding. And hopefully that awareness uh, will trigger um, some of us uh, to, to take action. Yes. And, and we, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, the environmental impacts of the mining, and there's also logging going on in the Congo, um, which um, brings brings me to uh, want to talk about uh, the role that the Congo plays in the world's uh, environment, not just local, but the global environment. And um, there's a uh, there's a, a short. Um, video available from Manga Bay about mm-hmm. uh, about the um, peat marshes in Congo. And I wanted to play just about a minute and a half of that. Um, yes. it's, you can find it on YouTube, but I just want to play a short, just to give a, a sense of uh, what's at stake here in the for the environment, for the global environment, really, in terms of the stability and health of the Congo itself. So here's that excerpt. Their hunch turned out to be correct. Examinations of the core samples revealed the most extensive tropical peatland on Earth. The peat here covers more than 145,000 square kilometers, or 56,000 square miles. That's about the size of England, and it spans the border region between the two Congos. Tropical peatlands serve as natural refuges for all kinds of threatened and endangered animals. Forest elephants, lowland gorillas, and bonobos, just to name a few and local communities depend on the services they provide. Yet it's the carbon the peat holds that has catapulted them into the global climate conversation. Scientists figure this partially decomposed plant matter in the Congo Basin contains more than 30 billion metric tons of carbon. That's about the same amount the U.S. emits from the burning of fossil fuels in 20 years. The team also figures that the relatively small peatlands, which cover only about 4% of the Congo rainforest, hold as much carbon as the trees across the entire rainforest. This carbon is a precious resource. The peat locks it away out of the atmosphere where it can further warm the planet. Climate scientists say that makes protecting that area vitally important. So that was uh, an excerpt from that that video about this peat, and and they said essentially the the peat itself is equal to all the forests, so the forests are ov- obviously also of importance 
Um, but that's, you know, that's an enormous amount of carbon. Um, and now there's um, international pressure to try to protect that, uh, f- at least from some sectors <laughs> internationally. Um, mm-hmm. And I wondered if you could talk uh, a little bit, Maurice, about the em- environmental importance of this region, um, obviously for the people of the Congo, but for the world and and how that might you know, maybe we could segue to talking about how that might present an opportunity to raise the 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 level of independence and um, health and well-being of the people of Congo. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, the Congo is a uh, a part of the second largest rainforest uh, in the world, uh, the Congo Basin, which entails about six countries or so, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, Central African Republic, uh, the Republic of the Congo, or Congo Brazzaville, uh, Gabon, uh, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea. And uh, the DR Congo is, counts for about 60% of it. Uh, and it's, it's a rainforest, the Congo Basin, that sequesters more carbon uh, than the Amazon. Uh, it is... Uh, and the peatlands in particular uh, represent a carbon bomb uh, that's, that needs, absolutely needs to be protected. Uh, the, the peatlands that we find in the Congo is the largest tropical uh, peatlands uh, in, in the world. Uh, so if, if your, your concern was strictly around the climate emergency or the climate crisis, uh, then this country in the heart of the African continent be vital, be on the top of your list uh, in terms of, uh, of concerns. Uh, we, what we've seen, what, what you've done, uh, Len, is really to put uh, front and center uh, the, uh, how can I say, the, the, the critical uh, importance of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, the, it's a nexus in uh, between the climate crisis on the one hand and the green energy uh, transition on the other hand. We see how the, the cobalt is vital uh, coming out of the Congo to the green energy transition, right? Right. And we see how the Congo Basin rainforest is vital to uh, the combating the climate emergency. So in this one country, you have uh, the uh, the climate crisis and uh, climate opportunity uh, existing, you know, side by side. Uh, so, but for the little value placed on the heart of the African continent, you would have a tremendous amount of focus and attention on the part of climate justice advocates, for example. Mm-hmm. clamoring to assure that the peatlands will be protected uh, so that the indigenous population who, uh, for them, it's not just the peatlands, but it's uh, their home. It's uh, where they uh, raise their children, uh, where yes. they uh, go, you know, uh, uh, get food. Uh, it's their ancestral land. It's where their spiritual uh, traditions are tied to. Uh, we would, do you think there'd be a rush to assure that those indigenous communities uh, would have all that they need in order to protect uh, the the rainforest, to protect the peatlands, not just for them, but for the entire planet. Right, because right. we're dependent upon them and their knowledge, their experience, their heritage in preserving, right, uh, the planet that's vital to our existence. Yes. But even as you look at the resources that go to the indigenous communities, less than one percent of the funding goes to support the work that they're doing to to sustain and preserve uh, the the rainforest. So there's just a you're right in using the word opportunity. There's tremendous opportunity uh, for not only the indigenous Congolese, but uh, uh, the uh, Congo overall 
and for all of us who are engaged, uh, those who are engaged in the climate, uh, in the combating the climate crisis, uh, to come to the side of the Congolese and join forces in assuring that the peatlands are protected, in assuring that the Congo Basin is protected, in assuring that the indigenous communities uh, are empowered uh, in order to preserve, preserve the rainforest. So uh, it's really um, an opportunity and an appeal. And uh, it's just fascinating um, to us how Congo just sits at the center of, uh, of this opportunity uh, to not only combat the climate crisis, but also to be a reliable source for the renewable energy uh, sector and the green transition. Uh, so, right. uh, and if, if the Congolese, the yeah, if the, I'm sorry, work, go ahead. yeah, I'm just saying if the, if the people who, who work in those mines gained a slightly larger percentage of the revenues that all those minerals bring in, it could make a huge difference for, for oh, their uh, lives. Absolutely. Right? It's not just a tremendous amount of difference, right? right? Recall I said earlier that, you know, seven out of 10 Congolese live in less than $2 a, a day. Right. You and know, I, I have to recall a study done in, uh, um, I believe it was in the uh, mid-90s, of people working in uh, the, the um, clothing and, and shoe industry in Indonesia. And it was found that if their wages were doubled, all right, doubled, um, that it would, it would cause the price of a pair of Adidas to go up 35 cents. Wow. And it's like... Wow. This is, you know, there's so much profit extracted after the material is taken out of the country that, yes. it's, you know, and I'm sure a similar equation would be found for mining in the Congo. In the um, Congo. And, yeah. and imagine if the Congo did what uh, Indonesia is doing, you meant brought up Indonesia, what they're doing, they're saying now that the minerals coming out, Indonesia is um, well known for its uh, exporting of nickel, that the minerals coming out now uh have to be uh, processed in Indonesia so that the value is added locally. Ah. Uh, so we're not even getting to that to that stage and uh, an Indonesian model, for example, yeah. you know, or a Chile model or a Bolivia model, you know, where uh, the the mines are controlled by the by the state and the state mining company and the people you know benefit uh, first and foremost. Right. So we're not sure. even at that stage yeah. in the Congo. Yeah. Well, um, Maurice, we just have. Um, uh, about five, not even four minutes left. And um, I want to invite you, um, Friends of the Congo states as part of its mission statement that it is to support Congolese institutions in bringing about a peaceful and lasting change. And I know you're working with organizations on the ground there. And I wondered if, if you have, in these few minutes we have left, if you could share a little bit about uh, what you're doing with organizations in the Congo. Yes, uh, seeing that we're talking about the mining sector and the uh, environment, we'll focus on those two. We work in a, uh, with youth movements, for example, they're organizing for social change, uh, with women's groups that uh, are farming and involved in uh, uh, health care and providing prenatal care for their children, uh, artists, uh, who are utilizing their music as a, as a means for uh, raising consciousness and bringing about change and uh, work with, uh, with journalists, uh, media uh, institutions, uh, especially uh, local radio uh, networks um, throughout the country. Uh, so uh, a wide range, uh, but uh, the two, two key areas that we, that we focus on that's really at the forefront right now, uh, one is working with indigenous communities in the in the Congo Basin rainforest and assuring uh, to the extent that we can that resources are channeled to them um, so that they can uh, be uh, fully empowered uh, to play their rightful role in uh, not only preserving the rainforest, uh, but assuring that they have sustainable communities uh, that, um, that serve the, uh, the population. Um, so we work with indigenous uh, leaders and communities uh, in the Congo Basin Rainforest. Uh, we also work uh, with um, uh, women organizers and uh, uh, youth in the mining sector in, in the Katanga province, uh, where uh, children are rescued from mines and given a path to uh, education 
Uh, we support the efforts on local organizers in that regard. Uh, support women who are uh, developing what they call climate centers, where they have alternative agricultural projects uh, and trying to uh, channel uh, women away from the mines into the agricultural sector. According to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, Congo has the agricultural capacity to feed an estimated 2 billion people. So it's a, wow. uh, a sector that's uh, underutilized and underdeveloped. Um, so the uh, organizers, organizations that we're working with are trying to maximize uh, that potential. Uh, so these are, these are some of the projects. People can go to our website at friendsofthecongo.org and you can uh, go on the, at the top of the page, you see our partners and you, you click down on, the, on those partners and you see the different uh, work that we do with, uh, with youth, uh, with children, uh, with women, with, uh, with villagers. Uh, you can get a, a full uh, reading of it on our website at friendsofthecongo.org. That's terrific, and it's inspiring that so much work is going on. We forget that no matter where there may be uh, challenges in the world, the people who are there are responding uh, in a positive Absolutely. way. And it's, it's wonderful your organization is able to support their efforts on the ground. Absolutely. Amplify their voices, provide a platform for them to speak to the global community, um, provide an avenue for uh, people of goodwill throughout the globe, to be engaged with them uh, as uh, uh, they uh, pursue uh, the change in the country itself uh, in the face of enormous um, odds. The bravery and the courage that they and the resiliency that they, they demonstrate is, is unparalleled, especially considering uh, the array of forces that are trying to get yeah. what Congo has, the multinational corporations, neighboring countries, multilateral oh. institutions, foreign governments, these are the forces that are arrayed against uh, the Congolese yeah. people. And that's why Friends of the Congo is saying that we, the people, are more powerful than all those forces. And if we know uh, what's unfolding in the Congo, we'll do what Lumumba said in his last letter to his wife uh, before his, um, his demise. He said, uh, we're not alone. Africa, Asia, free and liberated people from every corner of the world will always be found at the side of the Congolese. And that's the spirit in which we are pursuing our work uh, Great. with our brothers well, and sisters. Well, we're out of time. Maurice Carney, thank you. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the show, and I hope to have you back in the future. The pleasure is mine. Thank you so very much, Lynn. Take care. <laughs>